Our reading from the Gospels today is from Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes into, the, into his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. I'm actually going to stop at verse 40, because that's what I'm going to work with today. So it's Thanksgiving season again. We do it every year. And I'm sure we do some sort of Thanksgiving sermon alongside it, too. Uh, so I'm going to do one as well. <laughs> and I, I find these sort of topics, something like Thanksgiving, we do it so often, we do it every year, and sit uh, and it's come to be maybe something that's easier to talk about, maybe something that's even simple. But I've found that the most simple truths, the most beautiful ones, are often the hardest to practice, the hardest one to keep going. Uh, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. But I want to start off with a, with a, a story. I find it funny, it may just be a legend of my family, but it, it's a story nonetheless that I always found kind of amusing. Every Thanksgiving, my father would tell us about uh, one of his best friends uh, growing up who was a devout Catholic. And his mother was a very, very devout Catholic. And every Thanksgiving, two weeks beforehand, she would cook all the food, package it up, and send it to Rome for a blessing. And it would all get blessed and get sent back, and they would cook it again and partake it. And me and my Baptist family thought that was just hilarious. Ridiculous is the, is the word that we used. Extravagant is another that we could use. Radical is the one I choose to use. Radical because we now in this church believe in a radical way of living, the radical life of Jesus. We even have it on our website that says we practice radical welcome, radical acceptance, um, radical love. And as such, we start to build these radical practices. And when we view this story uh, from our apparently Catholic friends, I'm not sure if he actually made up the story or not, but you know, maybe not, I'm not sure. <laughs> it was quite a radical one, a radical practice of faith. Whereas we also practice radical. We practice radical love. In the same way, we apply these radical practices to that of thanksgiving is the question that I pose to you. And from the verses that we've read today, I do believe that we can. I believe that there is room for a radical thanksgiving to be had. Something that should be practiced every day, because what is practice? It is something that we repeat. It's not an event. It's a practice. Thanksgiving itself is merely an event. It's something that happens once a year. Thanksgiving practice is something that I'd like to encourage us all to try year round. I want to look to the scriptures and talk about what such a practice might look like. So in our first reading today from Psalm, Psalm 100, the first three verses I think spell out something fantastic. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Joyful. Worship the Lord with gladness. Gladness. Come into her presence with singing. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. 
those three verses are something amazing. Because it says to us, when we praise the Lord, do it with joyful noise. When we worship the Lord, do it with gladness. Come into our presence with singing. I don't know, but everything that I just said comes from right here. Gladness, joyfulness, singing, all of it right from the heart. And that's how we praise God. That's how God asks us to praise her, him, it. To do it with those things in mind in our hearts. And then we read through Matthew, and we read that Jesus is saying to us, For I was hungry. And you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, and so on and so forth. Particularly, I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. <coughs> He's not talking as if, imagine I am them, or imagine they, am me, they are me. He's saying directly, I am that which is a stranger, or the, those persons who are strangers. I am the person who is hungry. I am the person who is thirsty. And he's asking us, we who call ourselves righteous, to feed, to give drink, to welcome, to clothe, to accept, to visit. He ends, as I said, you did it to me. And when we say that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, for every one of you, Jesus as being so, somewhat of the divine, embodying somehow the presence of God, what does Psalms say to us to do, to praise him with joyful noise, with gladness, to give food with gladness, to give food with joyful noise, to welcome the stranger with gladness, with joyful noise, with singing. It has some pretty amazing implications, I think, when we look at those two together. Because we live in this sort of society where community, the people around us, is very separated. We sort of live in our little bubbles and we, that's really the only way we can live because there's thousands of people out there and we'll never know all of them. No matter how much we want to, there's millions of people out there and how could we ever accept every single one of them into our home to feed them, to give them drink? It's a daunting task in this world that we live in of global connection. How do we practice what we're said in Matthew when the world is so big and so disconnected? And yet it's not disconnected, is it? Everything we do, everything we eat, everything we touch has been touched by another, has been handled by someone else. The turkey that you're cooking for Thanksgiving who, who raised it? Who plucked it? Maybe a machine, I'm not sure. Um, who packed it into the truck? What about the person who put it on the shelves at the supermarket and the one that rang it up at the register? How many people have been a part of your life that you never even knew was there? How many strangers were there that you will never know the name of? That's the world that we live in, so connected and yet so disconnected. That is the world that we live in. So how do we practice radical thanksgiving? I believe there's a twofold challenge involved here. You can invite people into your home. Of course you can. You can feed them. But can you do it every day of your life? I'm not Mother Teresa. I don't know if I could ever live up to that standard. I don't know if I could ever, every single day, invite someone into my home and feed them or give them drink. I don't know if I could go every single day and visit someone in jail because there's certainly enough out there that you could do it every single day and meet a new person every single day. That is overwhelming and I don't know if I can do that. That's why they sort of become events, don't they? When we invite people into our homes, when we give them drink, when we give them food, it's usually for an event, for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, for something here or there. We've had to sort of consolidate these things into events. And yet, by doing so, they sort of 
lose their practice. The practice of Thanksgiving started, just gets put into the week of Thanksgiving. I know that's been true for me. I all of a sudden become a little bit more righteous in, in this week and, you know, be a little bit nicer to more people this week because it's Thanksgiving. You know, I call my family when I don't normally do. Or, because <laughs> if you know me, I spend like months without talking to my family. Uh, so all of a sudden, it's an event, not a practice. So what does the practice of Thanksgiving look like in this culture, this day and age, where everything is so very, very different? What does it look like? And I think it's a twofold challenge. So I'm gonna offer you that challenge today. As you walk through your paths for the next four days, try this out, and if it catches on, keep going. But for the next four days, give it a try. The next time you say even two words to someone, thank you, goodbye, hello there, offer them a little bit more. Offer them just a little bit more. Try and say something along the lines of, and from your heart, remember, with joyful gladness, say from your heart, I just want to say to you, thank you for being a part of my day, for being a part of my life. And if you see it in text, say your name. I don't know, but in this culture, that sounds a little bit radical. Just out of nowhere, say, thank you for being a part of my day. Recognizing that you and your life has crossed paths with my life. And I recognize it, and I am thankful for it. Will you ever know if the cashier is hungry, or thirsty, or without home, or stench naked in front of you, in whatever way that may be, unless you make it known that they matter to you. Even in these split moments, you know, it, I know it sounds hard to say to a stranger you've never met, thank you for what you do, but you know what they do. If you see a cashier, you know exactly what they do, and it probably engulfs their eyes. I've been a cashier. I've worked at 48 hours a week. You know what they do, but you never know who they are. Open the door. With a practice of radical thanksgiving, I think you open the door for a practice of radical welcome, which is how we define this church. A building of people of radical welcome. And it can begin with radical thanksgiving. The second part of the challenge that I'd like to offer you is to, when you stand over the food this Thanksgiving, this can be just one event if you like, and keep it going if you, do, if you want to. When you stand over your food the next time you do it, whatever food is on your table that you didn't grow yourself, offer thanks in prayer for those who are unnamed, those who are strangers, those you will never know who have helped you put the food on that table. Because I know that you work hard to pay for it, but a lot of people work very hard to get it there. I think it's worth offering a thanks to them as well. So that's the twofold challenge that I have for you today. In the spirit of Matthew and the spirit of the Psalms, do it with joyfulness. Do it with gladness. Do it from your heart. Do a practice of thanksgiving. And do it the way that you feel that you need to do it, from your soul and from your heart. And that is my challenge for you today. We're going to sing 422. Okay, please join me in singing hymn number 422, and I'm not going to...